phenomenon of anti-Semitism. Uh, anti-Semitism as a defining feature, jihadism, Muslim Brotherhood as the sort of the foundational organization for modern jihadism. Uh, so I'll have some uh, you know, abstract analysis <laughs> and some you know very very concrete examples of how that plays out. Um, in order to understand how an organization like the Brotherhood comes into being uh, entails also understanding how anti-Semitism comes into being. The, the two are connected, although anti-Semitism is much older than the Brotherhood. Uh, one, one thing that drives it, both anti-Semitism and the rise of the Brotherhood, is a, a deep longing for purity or goodness uh, and, and light. Uh, it's a longing to see the firm ground under your feet, to know the certainty what the truth is, uh, so that you don't have to grope your way in the dark. It's a longing for fixed formulas and ready answers. We've all seen this in our students. You raise the question, raise it, but what's the answer? What's the answer? What's the answer? <coughs> this is as old as Thales, the first philosopher in the Western tradition, who uh, was walking along one night, fell into a pit, climbed out of the pit, and said, never again will I take a step without being certain of the firm ground under my feet. It has to be perfect and pure. Uh, syllogism provides certainty. And certainty is, is tied to knowing the path, knowing the path it, it is essential to maintaining one's purity. Uh, it's also uh, essential to one's redemption. So um, the anti-Semitism that you see in, in the case of, I would say, the Nazis and the Brotherhood as well, is a redemptive, it has been called redemptive anti-Semitism. Uh, hating the Jew, I saved my soul. <clears throat> From the standpoint of the Brotherhood. Now, if, if purity is what I'm longing for, and think of the Nazis, term, Judenrein. At the Banzai Conference, when uh, the, the, the uh, Heydrich had, you know, and, and Eichmann and the others had uh, the table of Jewish populations by country, uh, there were a couple of regions that were Judenrein, purified of the Jews. Okay. Not just the Jews eliminated, but the region has been purified. The Jew, as I mentioned yesterday, is the contagion, is the contamination. And even as far back as the Hellenistic times, uh, when uh, Hellenistic and Hebraic modes of thinking and, and understanding the world collided, uh, the Hellenist thinkers under, were looking for perfection, certainty, knowledge, and the, the Hebraic thinkers kind of mess things up with question. It's messy. Uh, some of you perhaps have studied Talmud. It's messy. You open the daf, the page, you've got the Mishnah, okay, Mishnah. Then you get to the Gemara, and it's all over the place. And sometimes you go on and on. Uh, with a question, and finally, it's a, we can't figure this out. Eliyahu will have to give us the answer when he comes. Elijah. <laughs> Leaving that kind of loose end is anathema to the Hellenistic thing. It's messy. It's not pure. It's not clean. It's not clear. Now, so the Jew, just by the questioning, the Jew messes things up. It's not just the Jewish question that's a problem, but the Jewish questioning. That, that drives anti-Semitism. Uh, and indeed, uh, we have a teaching, 
Judaism that God is in the question. The El is in the She'elah. So, um, Rabban, uh, Rabbi Gamaliel used to begin his, in the first century his, his sessions by saying, ask. And he would end by saying, ask for it. You know, go forth and ask for it. There's always asking. The asking is more cru crucial than the answer the question. Even questioning God. And that's where it can really get messy. Um, in Islam, you don't question God. You submit. So, the Jews represent messiness. Now, uh, what happens with the rise of modernity the, the, and the shifting of, of centers from, from earth to sun, from uh, world to ego, uh, the, the rise of the age of reason, the, the undermining of religious institutions, the, uh, <coughs> the killing off of the kings, the ones anointed by God, which, as, as Albert Camus argues, the regicide is the deicide. Um, starts, I was, you know, really starting with the 18th century, uh, you have this the beginning of a, of a reaction to that, the, 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 you know, that contamination, the contamination of modernity undermining the, the holy, the pure, the true, the sacred. Um, in Europe, you see a rise of pietism, a, you know, parallel to the age of reason, Hasidism. I think these movements are, are, are uh, I mean, they, they have lots of elements going into them, but one out of one of many is a longing for holiness, goodness, the pure. The tzaddik is incapable of sin. The tzaddik has a connection that none of the rest of us have. Uh, and, and similarly, the holy one, the saint, and so on. Now, in the 18th century, we have Wahhabism, 1744, founded by Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab. Uh, Wahhabism would prove to, to be very influential on uh, Hassan al-Banna and uh, his understanding of Islam as a purist movement. Now, what, there's three main objectives as stated by al-Wahhab in, 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 in the movement that he initiated. One is uh, to purify Islam of pre-pagan practices. The origin is pristine. The, the origin of Islam uh, is, it comes with the revelation of what is pure, true, holy, pleasing to God. The, the, any, in, in any religion, look, I mean, just look at Christianity. Where does Easter come from? It comes from pagan elements, right? I mean, there, the, you know, any, the, the traditions that, 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 that don't come out of nowhere, and they have, you know, <coughs> contaminants that remain within them, as uh, al Wahhab is trying to get rid of that. He's also trying to purge Islam of Muslim scholasticism. What's that? Um, as you know, in the Middle Ages, the, uh, the Muslim thinkers rediscovered the Greeks. Um, Maimonides read Aristotle in Arabic, not in Greek. Right? He wrote, uh, Maimonides wrote in Arabic, responding to uh, Avicenna, for example, 11th century. Muslim scholastic, uh, 12th century uh, Averroes. Uh, Averroes, who uh, had read Maimonides. So you have this, there's an interesting interaction among the uh, mid mid key medieval Jewish and Christian and Muslim thinkers. It's very interesting. But what's, what's the thing that ties their interactions together? 
<laughs> Hellenistic thinking in general and Aristotelian thinking in particular as a method. It's more a, it's, it's more a method than uh, an ideology or a specific point of view. It's a way of approaching the truth. Um, Hobbes sees this as kind of a, ne a negative outside influence. Now, of course, in the, the age of the Enlightenment, 18th century, this, <clears throat> this uh, influence of reason as the high court of truth is, all, is returning. It's the age of reason. It's a source of contamination. Okay. Um, it interferes with the higher relation. It interferes with the faith you don't need faith to move mountains if you have reason and dynamite. And finally, he wanted to uh, purge Islam of the mystical teachings of the Sufis. Also, it's a, the Sufis were Muslim mystics. Uh, they're, I mean, they're, still, they're still here, they're still around. But they, uh, the, the, if you know the book, uh, The Way of the Sufi uh, by Idris Shah. It's a collection of Sufi tales and teachings. They're all, all the big, all the main Sufis are from the Middle Ages. What's wrong with the Sufis? Well, you find in the, among the tales of the Sufis, uh, the tale of the seven blind men and the elephant, which probably originates in India. On the bungee hunter, Sajjadah. Yes. Well, the Sufis picked that up. And you know the story. Mm -hmm. The seven blind men are trying to describe an elephant. <clears throat> Each is feeling a different part of the elephant and says an elephant is like a tree, like a wall, like a snake, like a rope. And uh, of course they argue with each other. <laughs> no, 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 he's not. No. And of course uh, the Sufi's point is that God is the elephant. <clears throat> Each of us has our, our very narrow vision of God, that God, like a true mystic, God is transcendent, and God is, uh, reveals himself to all in his own, according to his own way. Uh, somebody who wants a pure Islam can't tolerate that view, that all ways of approaching God are legitimate. There's only one way. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> also, critical here to the emergence of the brotherhood uh, are the teachings of even, even Tamiya, who was a uh, commentator on the Hanbali school of law. There are a number of schools of law in Islam, but there are four main ones that arose between in the 8th and 9th centuries. Uh, the Maliki school, the Shafai school, Hanbali, and Hanafi. <coughs> What the four of them have in common, among other things, is that they all, all these thinkers, legitimize jihad as holy war, uh, based on things like the sword verses in the Quran, the ninth sword. So, uh, the Hanbali school, uh, in, 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 whenever you read the background, of, of jihadist thinkers and writers, even Tamiya is almost always there. The Hanbali school is almost always there. But the Hanbali school, and with, I would say, coming in second, the Hanafi school, or the, the Hanbali is, is the, the way of thinking that, that most uh, extensively glorifies the path of jihad of the four. So, if you know that, um, number one, this desire for purity is what's driving Wahhabism, influenced by Hanbali, Jihad, it tells you that uh, you reach purity by any means necessary. You think of uh, Robespierre, French Revolution. What was Robespierre up to? He wasn't, at least he said, he wasn't just eliminating political enemies, he was purifying France. He's going to teach moral virtue with the guillotine. <clears throat> Beware of, 
of the ideologues who want to purify the land, the people, the folk, the Uma, the world. Um, it requires that it has to be totalitarian. Totalitarianism has this element of this drive for purification in it as well. Now, the the other another very significant movement and uh, reaction to modernity is Salafism, uh, which um, the, 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 the Salaf is uh, someone who comes from the beginning, the the original believers, the pure pristine origin of the of the way, of the path, of, of Islam. So it's you know back to back to the roots, back to the beginnings, back to the origins. Uh, these are names uh, that, that turn up when you study the rise of Salafism in the 19th century. Uh, Jamal al-Din al afghani Muhammad Abdul, and Rashid Rida. Um, that each one has his has his own outlook, his own agenda, but they're all three in different ways are associated with this rise of uh, the movement to purification. Now, also happening at this time, of course, uh, is the, I mean, the British in 1882 go into Egypt. This is bad news for a purist Muslim. It's, it's, not, it's not just a matter of a foreign power now ruling your land with their laws. It's a matter of contamination, desecration, uh, evil. They're, they're the British are jahili, right? They're immoral. It's, it's, it's having, you know, uh, it's, it's tantamount to having uh, agents of the devil in your midst. So it's, it's not just a different political system or power structure. It runs much deeper than that. So this is also, I, uh, I would argue, I mean, reacting to that foreign influence that, that is I mean, in, right in the midst of it after 1882. I mean, the world, the whole world is going that way. Um, it's also, I think, important to note that uh, these are not uh, a bunch of lunatics who come from the rabble or something. These guys are associated with uh, al Azhar University, which is probably the most prominent university in the Muslim world. Muslim Sunni world. Yeah, in the Sunni yeah, world. Sunni world. Sunni world. Sunni world. Sunni world. Of course, I mean, you can't. No, no, we go to Coleman, they run or something. So. But anyway. The other house. But anyway, Al Azhar is, is at the top of the, uh, of, of the places to study. Maybe next to Oxford. But Al Azhar. The association with Al Azhar is very important. Of course, many of the rectors of Al Azhar uh, have been. Very anti-Semitic, many of their comments. Um, now, among the uh, those figures that uh, were associated with Salafism, the rise of Salafism, is Rashid Rida, who uh, was again a purist. Uh, he viewed the West, Western influences, as a source of contamination and desecration. Uh, he uh, was born in Lebanon, studied in Syria, moved to Egypt, where he uh, had a, a very substantial influence on Hassan al-Banna. Now, al-Banna, whom, whom you've seen already, uh, was also influenced by Wahhabism, uh, read the uh, Hanbali, you know, Law text, uh, Rashid Rida, uh, hated the British, um, and in 1928 would establish the Muslim Brotherhood. There's another figure here 
in the history of these developments that has to be mentioned is Abdul Allah Maududi. Uh, Maududi uh, was born in Lahore, in, at the time India, uh, which is now in Pakistan. Uh, his, his aim was to bring to the world what he called true Islam. Now, this, the, the longing for purity is longing for truth. Just, I mean, if you have a discussion with Marxists, I once got into a, a little uh, exchange with a Marxist in uh, Buenos Aires. I was you know, giving a talk on uh, genocide. And he said, why don't you just admit that all genocide is perpetrated by capitalists? Well, Stalin, Pol uh, Pot, I mentioned a couple of Marxists. He said, those aren't true Marxists. <laughs> right? Maldudi is interested in true Islam, and not just in true Islam, but in uh, bringing true Islam to the world. Uh, he, 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 he maintained that if part of, in doing that, the world has to come under Sharia law. Islam has to be purged of secularism, nationalism, uh, women's emancipation, he maintained. Um, certainly communist, communism and socialism. Um, some of his thoughts, teachings, Islam wants the whole earth. If you're after purity, it's got to be the whole thing. It has to be total. Uh, the whole earth does not content itself with only a part thereof. It wants and requires the entire <coughs> inhabited world. You see, the, I mean, this is logical. This totalitarian thinking, given the premise, is perfectly logical. It says we are, of course, opposing the Jews to fulfill to fulfill the demands of our faith, and not for the sake of the Arabs. Well, duty is not an Arab. We're not in it for the Arabs. Arabs schmear us. I mean, it's not about the Arabs, from his point of view. The Jewish presence, the problem of the Jewish presence, is a problem posed to the faith, to Islam, to true Islam, and not to the Palestinians or the Arabs in the region, or it, it's not an ethnic, ethnic, it's not reducible to ethnic political issues. It has this absolute kind of, I would say, metaphysical dimension. Uh, Maududi was an admirer of uh, Hitler. Why? Because Hitler knew <coughs> how to wed politics and ideology, and even spirituality. <coughs> Uh, the Nazis were, if you, if you look at the rites and rituals, for example, of initiation into the SS, it's, it's like a big church service. Have you seen, anybody seen the films of this? It's, I mean, the, the Nazis were, were not anti-religion, they were anti-Judaism you know, and even Christianity. But they weren't. They were not you know, non-religious. So uh, one of the, another move that Maldudi makes that uh, that will will carry over and in, in his influence on all the other jihadists that came after him, including Albani, is this his insistence on the wedding of politics and religion. You can't separate them. You can't have true Islam without power. You can't have power without politics. Right. Now, um, those who study the history of the Brotherhood <coughs> break that history down into three sections. Stage of what's called the stage of insurrection. Uh, which is you know, the rise of the Brotherhood in 1928 until the 12th of February 1949 when secret 
agents of King Farouk assassinated Hassan al uh, and, and and made him a shahid, a martyr. Um, stage of ordeal. Following that, um, this this is the the time of the suppression of the Brotherhood in Egypt, uh, particularly after 1952, with the uh, you know the the coup that took over the government, uh, the the emergence of Nasser. Uh, the, the the stage of ordeal is characterized. Also, uh, by the persecution of Saeed Kutub, whom I'll speak about shortly, uh, who, who influenced everyone. He's another one of those who influenced everyone who came out. And then the stage of differentiation after 1967. What happened in 1967? Six-day war. Six-day war. That uh, created a theological problem. In the Muslim world, among many, that humiliation came from God. So the suppression of the Brotherhood was relaxed at that point by Saddam, <coughs> and then uh, and then they started spreading out. They were spreading out from the ghetto, but then the the, 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 the spread really took off. And I, 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 I date the end of this, it's 2011, uh, most just say 67 to the present. I think after the Arab Spring, you have another, the beginning of another stage. That's, that's open to art. So, you know about Hassan al -Ban. Um Founded the Brotherhood in 1928. Uh, he and, as I said yesterday, five others. They started with six. It's much bigger now. Um, the creed. I didn't. I, I recited the creed or told you the creed, but this is it. If you want to see it <coughs> in writing. Now, um, if you look at the creed, Allah is our goal. The Prophet is our leader. The Quran is our law. That so far, so good. Right. You know, pious Muslims say, Allah, I, I long to, uh, for my relation to Allah, I want to please Allah. The Prophet Muhammad is the, the leader or, or inspiration of the Prophet, the, the, you know, the, the one who received the rest, last revelation. The Quran we're given to live by. Then you get to jihad is our way. And death in the service of Allah is our highest desire. Uh, this is the innovation. Um, as I said yesterday, jihad takes on the status of a kind of sixth pillar. And indeed, uh, Abana would say that if anyone, anyone who doesn't die without fighting, without going on the path of jihad, he says, dies of a jahiliya death. An immoral death, a, ta a tainted, a tainted death. The death is not pure. So, uh, and, it's, and it's, this is the meaning. He says, of "Jihad is our path." But what does it mean to say "Jihad is our path"? Obama explains. It means if you don't die fighting, you're out. You have no place with God. This is a distinctively jihadist move. Uh, so you have the emblem with the, the, the word prepare, Quran and the swords, weapons. Um, that's the path. You've got the law and the path. The teaching and the path. Some of... Uh, Albana's uh, teachings, God has imposed jihad as relig a religious duty on every Muslim. If you can't, if you are, God forbid, uh, an invalid, then you can uh, give money to support the jihadist cause. 
uh, if you're a good mother, as the Hamas charter says, you can't, you know, you can't go fight. You raise children to go fight. You, you tie yourself to jihad in any way you can. Um, it's a duty from which there is neither evasion nor escape. To evade it is one of the seven mortal sins that guarantees annihilation. This makes not engaging in jihad unthinkable. Since the Quran commands us to love death more than life, victory can come only with the mastery of the art of death. And what is the art? Art? Art of death? What's, I mean, what's artful about it? You see, um, death becomes a task. Now you might say, well, now I, I would say, in most religious traditions, death is not just a natural phenomenon that overcomes us. It's, it's, it's a moment of testimony in our religious lives, whatever our religious life might be. Uh, I mean, a Jew is supposed to die saying the Shema. Right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, Lord is one. Um, here, However, the art of death is, is, is martyrdom. It's to die in the act of killing. Notice how the, the very notion of martyrdom or witnessing gets twisted here. Uh, it isn't dying by refusing to murder. Kiddush <coughs> Hashem. Kiddush Hashem, sanctification of the name, martyrdom in Judaism, is required uh, on, on three occasions. Uh, one, that you have to die rather than commit adul adultery. Two, you have to die rather than commit idolatry. And three, you must die rather than commit murder. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you see the, uh, the inversion of the thinking here. Now, during this period, this, is, this will prove historically later to be quite interesting, uh, Mubullah Khomeini met Albana in 1937. Uh, there were, by the mid-30s, Muslims from various parts of the world. And of course, Khomeini not, is not an Arab. He's Persian, Farsi. Uh, there, there were Muslims from various parts of the, the Muslim world, uh, Middle East mainly, who uh, went who went to Egypt, uh, Al Azhar, you know, was a center for for learning, uh, study, and there were you know people in the Brotherhood that they that number a number of them studied with, including uh, the, the future Ayatollah Khomeini. Now, when he was in the four, he was there in the late thirties and forties. And uh, when he was there in the thirties, he met a young man, <coughs> or in the forties, named Abab Safavi, also Iranian. Uh, Safavi was the founder of the Fetiyin Al Islam in, in Iran. Uh, you can see his, the date of his death. He died a martyr, you might say. They, uh, they would target individuals in the Iranian government. This is pre-revolution, pre-79. And, and you know, they, targeting assassinations. They weren't suicide bombing. The suicide bombing was a, was a later development. Uh, so Khomeini and Safafi were tight in the 40s. And Sababi is uh, famous for this statement. The Almighty himself taught us how to kill. So shall we not kill when it is necessary for the triumph of the faith? Killing is tantamount to saying a prayer. When killing is for the faith, it's an expression of your relation to God. 
It's an affirmation of a higher relation. It's, it's, it's saying something to God. Behold, I am your servant. Watch me kill the non-believer. This is a little disturbing, is it not? Saying a prayer. Killing is killing for the sake of the faith. Now again, notice the uh, just you gotta keep it's like taking the math, you've got to keep everything that's got before in mind. Attaining purity requires killing. Uh, the body, the metaphor of the body, the cancer has to be cut out of the body. The source of contamination has to be eliminated for the sake of the soul. <clears throat> what does the, the contamination threaten? It threatens my eternal life. I have to kill it. I've mentioned the connection between Abana and uh, Husseini yesterday. Um, Husseini, who, uh, you know, deepen the connection between the Muslim Brotherhood and the Nazis. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, as I mentioned yesterday, sent de delegations to the Nuremberg rallies. They sent uh, members to participate in the Arab Revolt in 1936. They, between 1936 and 1938, their membership went from 800 to 2,000. So uh, this during the period of insurrection, it's, a, it's also a period of, the, of the, the growth in the movement. One of the things that attracted members to the Brotherhood is the revolt against the Jews. Okay. The anti-Semitism, anti Jew hatred, is, 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 a, is foundational to the thinking. If the West is a source of contamination, the West is it's because the West has been contaminated by the Jews, controlled by the Jews. The imperial powers of the West can't do anything unless the, the invisible wire pullers, the Jews, okay. Um, in 1946, the the Brotherhood opened its first office in Jerusalem. Within two years, uh, before 46 to 48, they had branches in Jordan and Sudan and several others in Palestine. Uh, by 1952, they had more than 50 offices in Sudan. So they're, they're spreading out. Um, I mentioned Arafat, uh, it's, who uh, joined the Brotherhood in 1946 under the tutelage of Hajimunah Hussaini um, yesterday. Uh, Arafat uh, received military training from the Brotherhood, military training supervised by former Nazis, German military. Thousands, literally thousands of Nazi war criminals went to the Middle East. It was one of their destinations. South America was another one. The Middle East welcomed Nazi war criminals. Um, Egypt and Syria. Oh, Arafat got his training in Egypt. Yes. And and he he was uh, he was among the, the members of the Brotherhood who fought in the war in '47 before the outbreak of uh, the war for independence. Um, this this is one of Arafat's comments on homicide bombing in 2001. And this is a, this is a you know <coughs> Brotherhood uh, inspired, Al Husseini inspired, jihadist inspired view. Uh, this is a bombing that took place in Tel Aviv. Yeah. It's in the heroic martyrdom. Heroic martyrdom is you know, one of their key phrases. Uh, the heroic martyrdom operation of the man who turned his body into a bomb is the model of manhood. And the 
sa and sacrifice for the sake of Allah and the homeland. Uh, this is what it means to be a human being. It's a model of manhood. Um, so I, um, I suggested yesterday that a fundamental question for anybody's uh, ideological, religious, philosophical, theological outlook is, what is a human being? What makes a human being a human being? So, but this is the model of manhood. The, uh, this is a photo of the Brotherhood Brigade. Um, you know there was fighting in Palestine long before, many, many, many months before 19, May 1948. This is before the UN resolution, November 1947, calling for a partition. There was fighting ongoing. Um, so, uh, you know, hostilities didn't begin on May 15, 1948, you know, the day after the Declaration of the Jewish State. And the Brotherhood had their brigade fighting in 1948. Now, uh, 47, and then on, on through. Now, we move to the stage of ordeal, which uh, revolves around Saeed Kutub. Um, Kutub was um, an aspiring writer, writer in the 30s and 40s, and he wrote, he actually wrote a fair amount of uh, literary works. He was a member of the Waft Party, which was an Egyptian nationalist party. He switched to the Sa'adist Party, which is uh, ultra-nationalist, <laughs> because the Waft wasn't nationalist enough for him. Um, he, he studied uh, the writings of uh, the Hambali jurist Ibn Tamiya. Also, I mentioned Ibn Tamiya earlier. Uh, he became uh, friendly with members of the Brotherhood in the 40s. Um, he went to the United States in 1948 to study uh, education, and, uh, first in Colorado and then at Stanford University. When he was in the U.S., he was horrified by the rampant immorality, the jailia, of such a decadent. <coughs> Imagine if he were to go to the U.S. now. <laughs> this is 1948. You know, when you couldn't say damn on the radio. <laughs> so, so he, I mean, he's... He was like, reminds me of like uh, when it said uh, when Menachem Begin once made a trip to Las Vegas for a fundraiser, from the airport to the venue, he covered his eyes and said, you know, uh, Babylon, 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 and, and wouldn't look at anything until he left. Anyway. Um, Kutub spent two years like that, with his covering his eyes and ears, in, this, in the uh, horrific land of decadence, and demo democracy is a form of idolatry in his view. Okay. Of course, this corruption, this filth, comes from the Jews. So when he returned in 51, he became a full-fledged uh, member of the Muslim Brotherhood, with whom he had had relations. And he would later describe 1951 as the year of his birth. Um, in 1953, he wrote uh, a long essay called Our Struggle with the Jews. And uh, in, in that, you have all of the classical, you know, anti-Semitic <laughs> statements and claims that the, the Jews are, you know, from the beginning, the Jews have been the enemy of Islam from the outset. So if, you, if, the, if the, the, the purification of the tradition entails uh, a return to, the, to the, the pristine origins, at the time of the pristine origin, you also have this evil that's opposing it, i.e. the Jews. 
the, 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 the tribes, the, the Banu Nadir, Banu Kanaika, and the Banu Kuraisa. Banu Kuraisa, which was uh, the tribe, Jewish tribe, wiped out by Muhammad, and the other two were expelled. So, why? I mean, because, I mean, the Ashtola Khomeini brings this up from the beginning. Why? Because the prophet saw from the, from the, from the very start the source of the danger, the contamination, the evil that threatens Islam. An irredeemable evil. Um, so, some of his uh, teachings. Once again, this, this, sound, this is like right out of uh, Madhuri, who had a big influence on Kudu. That, you know, jihad aims at converting all humans on the entire earth. Of course, that doesn't include the Jews. They're not human. You can't convert them, according to Kuta. But the, so it's uh, an expansionist militancy which aims at liberating the whole of humankind. There's no enslavement more pernicious and insidious than Western democracy, than you know, license, uh, it, the, 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 the freedom to do anything, say anything you want. As, as uh, Albana said, Islam <coughs> controls every facet of life, public and private. There's no distinction. Indeed, in, in, in any totalitarian system, there is no distinction between public and private. You see that there can be. I remember when I was in graduate school in a galaxy far, far away, long, long ago, um, <laughs> studying Russian. And at the time, there were the Soviet Union still existed. So that's how I'm old. And uh, when, when uh, we would have visitors or, or people, refugees from the Soviet Union, they had the hardest time understanding privacy, what it means, or even how to translate it. It's the word lichni, which is personal, but not exactly private. Right? You know, Russian. So, <coughs> so, totalitarianism can't tolerate privacy. Now, the one difference between Soviet totalitarianism and um, Islamic jihadist totalitarianism, as Albana Al says, Islam controls every aspect of life in this world and the next. It's so total, it goes into the heavens. Now, um, just beware, again, of uh, otherworldly traditions. Traditions that, that, that put their, ac their, their main accent on the paradise of the next world and not on this world. So uh, that's the, you know, the liberation comes <coughs> with the realization that you're, you're only free when Islam controls everything you do, say, think, and feel in this world and the next. Uh, the Jews, as Kutub says, are you know, the blackest devil, the source of the worst and anti-Islamic machinations. They're always plotting, not, not only against humanity, but against Islam. Uh, they are the e eternal enemy of Islam. They are the evil that plagues humanity, as clearly shown in the protocols. Kutub also invokes the protocols of the elders of Zion. <clears throat> the yes, the, the the battle is eternal. Recall the, the remark from uh, Muhammad Hussein uh, Yaqub that I mentioned yesterday: our, "Our our war with the Jews is eternal; will not end until not a single Jew is left." Um, Kuta maintains that anyone who says jihad is, is not violent doesn't know doesn't understand jihad. 
uh, Islam, he says, is a system for the whole world and is obligated, Muslims are obliga obligated to destroy any obstacle to implementing that system by any means necessary. You see what this, the implications when you're talking uh, nuclear arms deals. By any means necessary. Um, the Jewish state is the embodiment of the Jewish evil, according to Kudu. Um, so that the jihadist view of the Jews doesn't derive from the reestablishment of the Jewish state. In other words, they don't hate Jews because of, is of Israel or policies of Israel, or fences, or checkpoints, or settlements. It's the other way around. They hate the Jewish state because of the <coughs> Jews. I mean, as, as Yaakov says, if the Jews didn't occupy anything, we would still hate them. It's not about the occupation. Uh, and I'll, I'll say more about that in a moment. So, you have this from uh, Kuta, the Satanizing of the, Jew, of the Jews, even more vehemently than Albana. Uh, every jihadist after Kuta studied milestones and our struggle against the Jews. And, and he wrote several other, he wrote a book on social justice. He, as, as I said, he was a literary writer. He, he was a pro prolific writer, but the, the book called Milestones uh, is most influential. All, all the Kutubas <coughs> would read Milestones. Other developments during the uh, time of the By the way, Kutub was, he was uh, arrested in 1955 by, under the NASA regime and released in 64. <coughs> arrested again in 65 and hanged in 1966. So, um, I mean, Nasser, like Mubarak, like Sisi, <laughs> knew that the, the brother was, was going to pose a serious threat to their power. And indeed, uh, Kutub and, and others, his uh, ill, would look at leaders of the Arab world, like Nasser, and denounced them as Zionist agents. Now, if you if you know if you've ever read the uh, the broadcast te the text of the broadcast from Nasser in the six seven eight months leading up to the Six Day War, he's not very sympathetic toward Israel. Mm -hmm. But he's a Zionist agent. Right. He's part of the Jewish conspiracy. Like I like I see. He's, he's an Israeli stooge or something. So it was this, um, this issue of Minister Chazen. Recently, after what happened in 2013, when the CC is throughout uh, most young Muslim was a hope for the power, they said his master came from Morocco and she, he, she was a Jewish and he is Zionist working for Israel. Yes. And the regime also used the same to mean against the same. Said that Hassan and Banna was for Morocco and Morocco and he from. A Jewish family and the yes, I was like, most of them was the same. Okay, thank you, Joseph. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Yes. Uh, but so, but any anything that's not with the uh, Islamic jihadist agenda is Zionist. It's it's that's the Manichaean good and evil division. Right? Either either Zionist Jewish or the the stooges of the Zionist and Jews, right? The lackeys of the Zionist. And Jews. Um, Ahmed Yassin, as you recall, was the, you know, was the, the founder of uh, Hamas. He joined the Muslim Brotherhood during this time of ordeal in 1957. Uh, he was, as I mentioned yesterday, in uh, 72, went to Gaza to set up a, you know, an outpost there for the Brotherhood and uh, later and 87, December 87, would be the founder of Hamas. Um, 
Another important figure to uh, hook up with the Brotherhood, well, the, yeah, the first some of Yassin's teachings, which I didn't really put up. Um, Jewish state must disappear from the map. Uh, sons of Islam everywhere, the jihad is a duty to establish the rule of Allah on earth and liberate your countries. This idea of liberation, the truth will set you free. It's, it's a redemptive liberation. It's not, now I'm free to do whatever I want. It's not the freedom that you, you think you have when you leave your, the home of your mother and father and get your own place. It's, it's a redemptive freedom. It's salvific. So, uh, liberate your countries and yourselves from America's domination and Zionist allies, either victory or martyrdom. Of course, both, both are paths to salvation. Victory is a path to salvation, martyrdom is a path to salvation. Uh, another very important figure to align himself with the Brotherhood during these years, uh, he joined the Brotherhood in 1960s, uh, Abdullah Azam. Sheikh al Mujahideen. Pardon? Sheikh al Mujahideen. Yes. Yeah. Um, Abdul Azam is, uh, he wrote, uh, one of his main works is uh, Join the Caravan. He was a big influence on uh, Osama bin Laden. He was part of the uh, creation of Al Qaeda. He had a hand in drafting the Hamas Charter. Uh, he was a uh, representative of the Brotherhood in uh, Damascus. He, um, he, in his writings, he said he, he lists quite a number of rewards that come to the shahid, the, the martyr. Uh, with the first drop of the martyr's blood, he says, all the martyr's sins are forgiven. It's purified. <coughs> Washed in the blood, I guess, of, his, of himself. Um, he goes on to marry 72 virgins. Now, you might think, well, this is stupid. Who would want to have 72 virgins anyway? <laughs> what would you do? There's <laughs> no picnic for the virgins. But this is, a, this is it's a metaphor. Um, but much more important than that is that he also has the opportunity to intervene on behalf of 70 of his family members for their, for their redemption. This takes it to another level, doesn't it? He's a messianic figure, at least for, for his family. You see how the, why the family would build a shrine to their son who martyred him, martyred himself. You can see why uh, communities would admire him. Uh, if, if you read uh, in the Hamam Hamas Charter, as I pointed out, it's the duty of a good Muslim mother to raise her children for jihad. This, if, if then the children bring redemption to the family, that doesn't look so insane. If, that, if you believe it, how do you deter it? Think of it, think of it, think of it. You're a, young, you're a young guy, or more and more, a young woman. You love your family. You would do anything. You would die for your family. Happily. With Thanksgiving. Accent on eternal life, next world, other world. I can bring eternal life to my family. What greater love than this hath a man for another than to give his life? Not just to save your life now, it's not just throwing myself on a hand grenade. 
save the souls of my family. And when you have a believer, this is a problem. This is very difficult to, to oppose and to, to combat. Um, so you, I mean, you see, from the outside, things like the Muslim Brotherhood look absurd and ridiculous and insane. But from the inside, it's not so absurd, ridiculous, and insane. Very intelligent people become part of the movement. So in order to understand it, in a way, I think you, you have to feel the attraction. Why would somebody with good intentions and above average intelligence be devoted to it? Now, Azam, uh, you know, got around. Um, he has, I mean, some of his uh, teachings. Those who believe that Islam can flourish and be victorious without jihad, fighting, and blood, are illusion and do not understand the nature of this religion. Haras Rafiq does not understand the nature of the religion, according to Abdullah Hassan. If only the Muslims would apply their <coughs> Lord's command and implement the laws of their Sharia for just one week in Palestine, Palestine would be completely purified again of the Jews. Sharia is about purification. Uh, in, in most religious traditions, Pure, purity is a very important thing. We have, in Judaism, the laws of family purity. One of the six orders of the Talmud, the Torah, the, the, on, on matters of purity. Um, so it's not, I mean, the, the, the issue of purity is, is, is not alien to human thinking, but the question is how do you regard it, how do you deal with it, how do you understand it, how do you attain it? Here, the rich, instead of the ritual bath for Assam, if there is a ritual bath, it's a blood bath. You see. Um, I will mention this scene with this, the, the, uh, the end of the age of ordeal, I'll pause here. With the war of 1967, let me just reiterate that uh, this was a huge opportunity for the Brotherhood. The, the, the humiliation of the Arab armies. This is Allah's punishment. They got the attention of a lot of people. Uh, suddenly, Saeed Kutub's writings are selling like hotcakes. Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Big sell. Uh, you know, the jihadist texts are out there. And uh, <coughs> soon Sadat would let them out of jail. But by the early 70s. Big mistake. For him. Anyway, maybe for the next 10 or 15 minutes, we should. Okay. At this point, I should entertain some questions before the break. <clears throat> yes. Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, the, I would say, the contrast that you showed between the Jewish culture, which is a, a culture of questions, and the culture, uh, and the culture, or maybe the Christian perception of uh, a Muslim Brotherhood, which is total submission. Now, when I listen, I was listening to your talk, and I hear a lot of quotes, a lot of ideas. What I was missing is maybe the context, and perhaps you can refer to it. And today in uh, Egypt, the average person, Rami, correct me if I'm wrong, lives from about one dollar a day, yes. uh, maybe less. <coughs> and the question is whether the economic situation contributes to acceptance of such kind of ideas. And that means, and this could be for being a bit 
you know, economic thinker in that case, that if we improve the economic situation, maybe such kind of ideas will be less popular? That's a very good question. Uh, the economic situation provides an opportunity for the, the promoting and disseminating the ideas. It's, it's a fertile ground for the ideas to grow. The economic situation doesn't create the ideology. The ideology exploits the economic situation, as I see it. Uh, the fact that you're poor that it doesn't mean you're, now you're going to be a murderer. But there are lots of poor people who are not murderers and don't want to be murdered. Right. Uh, the, uh, know, the civil rights movement in the United States, uh, in the, 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 the movement, part of the movement led by Martin Luther King is a good example. Of poverty doesn't mean you're going to go out and kill people. It can mean nonviolent recipients. Mahatma Gandhi lived in India, was, was, you know, still the place where poverty is everywhere. So poverty isn't the cause, but poverty can be something to be exploited to promote the cause, the, what you're, the, the movement. And that's, that's how I would see it here. But you're right, the con you do have to keep in mind context. You've got to keep in mind British occupation. You've got to keep in mind uh, the, the, the King Farouk and his suppression, Nas Nasser, uh, nationalist movements, uh, the political environment. It has to be kept in mind. The, the Six Day War is another context for a shift in the, in the direction of the Brotherhood. So um, it's a good question, and it, it, has, it has to be addressed. Thank you. Um, my question would be about the uh, popularity of the Muslim Brotherhood today. I mean, um, how popular are they? How much influence do they have on the government of the Muslim world? Uh, are there any political parties which they are linked to? Uh, so, I, I would like to assess the significance of uh, the Brotherhood today. Um, I'll talk about that in the second half of today further, but they, I mean, they, they are present throughout the world. So if, if presence is popularity, then they're extremely popular. There are many, uh, in fact, most jihadist movements, as I will discuss a bit later, uh, are traceable in their origins to the Brotherhood, uh, to Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is traceable to the Brotherhood. Many movements are traceable to Al-Qaeda. Uh, the Brotherhood also has uh, organizations that uh, are either very sympathetic to them or actually align with them throughout Europe, throughout the UK, uh, North America. Uh, Haras was telling me yesterday there, there are more than two dozen in the UK. I mean, no, groups, yeah, with that affiliation. So I would say that indicates the, high level of popularity. Um, the two governments that are most tightly associated with the, uh, the thinking and teaching of the Brotherhood are Sudan, the Sudanese government, and the Iranian government, which I will talk about uh, after we break. Thank you. Thank you. Could you talk a little bit about how um, the Brotherhood views Christianity and where that fits in? They're kufr. They're they're non-believers. They're a threat to the Brotherhood, to Islam, to humanity. They're uh, in. Uh, I mean, uh, Bin Laden used to refer to the, the Jews and the Crusaders. The Crusaders are the Christians. Um, of course, the Brotherhood is not the first organization or movement to view the Christians as a source of contamination, as you know, as evil enemies. That goes back to to the beginning when, uh, you know, when the Arabs moved into Palestine and took Jerusalem in the six six seventies. 
So yeah, the bad news for the Christians. Well, I mean, if you read the, the news, you know about the, the riots against Christians, uh, slaughter of Christians, ISIS, slaughtering Christians. So this is, yeah, Christians are a problem. But where, where do the Christians get their contamination from the Jews? <coughs> The Jews are prior to precede the Christians. Okay. Um, would you say that the Muslim Brotherhood is a modern organization and movement? Uh, yes. Certainly in its view of, of the Jews. Yes, I would. <coughs> Even though they want to go back to, yeah. In the 2010, Tariq Ramadan, with um, the guest of the French radio and TV, where he promoted the ideas of the Muslim Brotherhood. As a professor, how could you explain the blindness of the French media, French authorities, and French history? The blindness? Yes. Uh, well, there are lots of reasons. That in academia, there's a similar blindness, and, and not just in the media. Um, they, there are several reasons. Uh, one, most people, even most professors, know very little history, as a matter of fact. Which is, as I discovered, I wasn't a history major. I, mean, I, I had degrees in philosophy and comparative lib, but I discovered pretty early on that one of the most important areas you have to study is history. You can't make sense of anything. Number one. Number two, they're terrified of uh, appearing to be uh, prejudiced or, or bigoted or uh, intolerant. Uh, God forbid, God forbid. So th they're very reluctant to, to stir anything up. They, when I say they, I'm talking about people in the media and people in the academia as well. Um, in uh, some cases, and I know a person, I know people in this room who know, have either experienced or know of cases, there are individuals who have lost their jobs when they say something. I have friends, I have maybe half a dozen friends who have lost jobs over over this and related. Okay. The sort of the facts about uh, anti-Semitic uh, attitudes of Brazil and uh, Jewish people, Jews. Uh, uh, but uh, which factors played important role and uh, determinative role for legitimate uh, party in Egypt? And, uh, could you say what factors played a role in legitimating? Legitimating uh, to, to power, power, to power. Um, Because terrorist groups uh, uh, legitimizing to, or allowing to cover. No, it's illegitimate to know. Yes. Um, if, if you um, are you thinking of 2011 when yeah. they forced came to power? Yeah. Line. Well, I think the economic uh, variable is important. The the view of corruption. The same thing that that. Uh, enabled the rise and legitimized the rise of Hamas. That is to say, the political <coughs> corruption that people could see and that people you know, were disgusted by and rejected. And the, the Brotherhood provides a, a pure, a cleaner alternative. Uh, the, uh, my guess is that um, most people uh, in the Arab world are, are, don't actually read the text. The, the leaders do, the ideologues do, the, the Abdullah Azam read the text. Most people don't read the text, but they, they hear the discourse, they hear the promise, um, they know that they see the corruption in their governments. 
and the Brotherhood said, we will clean up the corruption. We will have, a, you know, a, a, an honest, true <coughs> path. That, that's, uh, that draws a lot of people. Now, I think, uh, I would say, and I'm open to correction on this, but I would say Morsi was uh, eliminated not so much by popular, a popular movement as by a power struggle at the time. So, uh, do you know the question? But uh, just to carry on, just a quick comment the last, regarding the last two comments. It's interesting that uh, the first thing that President Obama, well, that, that the elected President Obama, Obama did before he was the actual president was give Tariq Ramadan a visa as one of his first uh, actions. And regarding Egypt, the State Department and the, administ the American administration played a major role, I think, in being supportive of the Brotherhood during the time of Morsi. Morsi was a professor in California, right, before he did Is that true? Is that true, by the way? I believe so. There is a big debate about that. Thing. Okay, well, I, I believe from California, but we, I can, if we can get into debate. And I think, I think it's also very important as a footnote to look at the 2009 speech where the Brotherhood was invited honored guests mm -hmm. and uh, Mubarak jumped in to attend the, the, the speech. So the 2009, it's on YouTube, I'd recommend watching it. Do you have a final quick point? Yeah, I'll maybe it in the next session because it's not that quick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next session. Did the Brotherhood change uh, goals through, the, through time or through these changes of uh, heads or sages adding more ideology? Good question. Uh, they didn't change goals, but they changed strategies and or tactics. And uh, especially after in the 70s and the end of the 70s with Camp David, that, that led to the shift in strategies, the discussion of how violent should we be or not. So the ultimate aim is the same. The, the division within the Brotherhood and, and the, the splitting off of other groups you know, comes with how do you get there. So it's more a method of you know, means than end. The, the means shift, but the end remains the same. What was the turning point of shifting from just being in the Middle East to the whole world? And what was the reason? Uh, well, <coughs> They began spreading into the, in other regions of the Middle East in the late 40s and into the 50s, uh, North Africa. Uh, as uh, the opportunity arose, the, the expansion continued. It was always expansionist. The, the ideology was expansionist. It, it, it's an ideology that has to uh, be spread throughout the globe. So whenever there's an opportunity to expand, they would expand. I mean, Al-Qaeda would, would, would seek opportunities for expanding, not just to Africa and the Middle East, but, but to South Asia, <coughs> Southeast Asia, Philippines, North America, South America, you know, all, over the, all over the world. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question. Um, the what you say that the thinking of the Islamists you represented here are more influenced by the situation in their own countries um, or by the experiences in countries um, where they studied like um, say the Pope, um, you said? You know. Say Kutub have studied in Egypt and in the US. Yes. Um, what, well, the question refers to the um, to the um, thinking of uh, modernity of the Islamists, and uh, my question refers to the discussion um, if anti-Semitism is an import um, from the Western um, societies or um, it stems from the experiences um, of the people they live in countries um, that changed? <coughs> That's a good question. Um, well, they, if, you, uh, if you read Kutub's text, uh, our, our Struggle with the Jews, 
he finds many, many, many passages from Quran, from Hadith, to legitimize his anti-Semitism and his view that the Jews are the blackest devil and evil. So, and, and he argues that from, from, the, from the Prophet Muhammad, we are taught to hate the Jews. Uh, it's not just because he went to Stanford and saw sex, drugs, and rock and roll all around himself. It's not just because the British are occupying Egypt, although these are exacerbating circumstances. Uh, there are circumstances that, that would lead him to, to look for uh, long-standing truths and traditions in his religion to understand what's going on. So, uh, the, again, the circumstance doesn't cause the anti-Semitism. The anti-Semitism affects how you are reading the circumstance, as I see it. So thank you. So we're going to break for tea and reconvene at 11. Thank you. Thank you.